<clears throat> so the next step is typically uh, alignment. So the, the question in alignment is, uh, given some fragment, how do we decide uh, which genomic location it could have come from or which transcript it could have come from? So most methods use uh, what's called a seed and extend uh, algorithm. Um, I'm using that term a bit uh, loosely. Uh, so if you're familiar with BLAST, it's not the same type of uh, seed and extend algorithm. It's, uh, we'll talk about it in a second. Um, and the first step is typically in most of these analyses is to build some sort of index from some transcriptome or a genome. So if you're using cufflinks, for example, uh, there's a number of different options for aligners. Uh, there's HiSat, Star, Top Hat 2, um, and a number of other different aligners that all can align to the genome. Uh, and that'll go into some BAM file and then you'll output it to cufflinks. And, and use it in cufflinks. Um, and then if you're using a tool like uh, Express that works at the transcript level, I, I meant to put Arsim there, I'm not, I totally forgot to put it there, but if you're using Arsim as well, you might use a Bowtie or Bowtie 2, and this aligns directly to the transcriptome. And what, what I mean by that is that you actually take the cDNA sequences from the transcriptome. So you don't take the genomic uh, sequences, you take just the cDNA of the transcripts, and you align directly to that. So you, you would build a Bowtie index on the FASTA file that comes uh, from like Ensemble, for example. Um, and then there are also other sort of alignment-free, or we call, typically call them uh, pseudo-alignment techniques, um, which uh, will use the transcriptome. Uh, Callisto, Sailfish, and Salmon are all examples that, uh, that do this. And these methods are significantly faster than doing uh, a classic alignment. And I'll explain why that is in a few minutes. And then uh, these raw reads are then compared to this index, and all the possible matches are reported. Okay, so what is a seed and extend algorithm? Um, so this is, I'm, I'm really loosely basing this off of the bow tie algorithm. So, um, and this is not exactly a seed and extend algorithm. I'm, again, I'm using that phrase uh, uh, very loosely here, but uh, I lost my cursor here. Okay, I guess that's not happening. Um, yeah. Okay, so basically you start off with some read, and in this case we define the seed to be uh, three bases long. So typically what you uh, expect is that the, the very beginning of the read has a few to no errors. Okay, so in this, uh, in this particular uh, algorithm that I have here, we're not allowing any errors in the seed. Okay, so let's say we have four potential matches. You start off with the first one, and um, you see that the first uh, sequence uh, character aligns, so A and A uh, align, um, or they match, and then the second character, G and A, do not match. So we automatically discard that one because uh, there's an error in the seed. Now the second uh, potential hit is A, G, C, uh, and then A. Um, so, uh, the first, we're not allowing more than one mismatch in the rest of the read with this algorithm, and this is pretty typical. You'll have like some number of uh, basically mismatches that you'll allow outside of the seed. So in this algorithm, we, we don't allow more than one mismatch, um, and there's too many mismatches, so we discard this, uh, this alignment. Now, the, the final two alignments are actually alignments that uh, Bowtie might report. So the reason for this is that there's only one mismatch outside of the seed, and the second one is a perfect match. So if there were some error or something in the sequencing, it's possible that you really could have, your fragment really could have came from the uh, third sequence rather than the fourth one. Um, it could have just happened, you know, randomly. Um, so this is fine for uh, transcriptome level mapping, right? So if you're doing like bow tie analysis, uh, then you can. This is okay, but uh, the tr if you're trying to align to the genome, you actually have splicing going on, right? So you have to f have an algorithm that is aware of uh, splice junctions. Um, so one of the oldest sort of common algorithms that people use is the Top Hat algorithm, and this is sort of uh, this is a uh, figure from the Top Hat Two paper. Um, so in this algorithm, you basically start off with a uh, aligning to the transcriptome, and then it reprojects the uh, coordinates onto the genome, and then it maps all, uh, all the, or tries to map the, the unmapped reads to the genome, and then whatever it has left over, it tries to uh, basically break up into many different segments and map those sa segments across the exonic regions, or across the exon junctions. 
so that you can actually map uh, across these, these sort of really long junctions and get uh, genomic reads that span them. Does this make sense? Does anyone have any questions on any of the stuff that I presented in the last few minutes? Okay. Okay, so now uh, the idea of pseudo alignment. Let me grab my water bottle real quick. Yeah. Just, just to spur discussion. So, so do you recommend, uh, what are the trade offs in terms of aligning to the genome versus aligning to the transcript in your, in your perspective? Um, so, as far as quantification is concerned, both of them are pretty comparable. I think all the benchmarks show that most tools are more or less in the same area. And I mean, it depends what you're benchmarking. I mean, benchmarking is a bit of a subjective art as well. Um, so I, I think as far as quantification is concerned, um, it's kind of a black art in the sense that um, I think everyone's trying something, everyone's doing something pretty good, and I honestly can't tell you which is like the most correct thing to do. Uh, genomic alignment, though, does have the benefit of being very easy to visualize. So if you want to take a look at all of uh, all of the mapping across all of the junctions at the genomic level, uh, it's a lot easier to visualize. You actually have to reproject the transcript uh, reads back to the genome if you want to visualize them in anything that makes sense, right? Because you know, when, when you're aligning directly to the transcriptome, you have you know, just a sequence file and you treat it as a contig. So there's no real way to make sense of the genomic uh, locus with, uh, with transcript level reads. Um, that being said, there technically are tools that do reproject back to the genome. Um, I haven't had a chance to actually like clean some of them up so that it can be used with a Callisto, but in principle you can do this. It'll probably take like a few days to sort of tinker around with some of the tools. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, really the genomic reads off, uh, just offer better visualization. That's like the one thing that uh, genomic reads. But they are, it, it takes a bit more work to get a genomic mapping, right? You have many, many more uh, possibilities as well. Okay, so what is a pseudo alignment? Um, so Nick Bray uh, came up with this idea um, for his thesis in uh, 2014. And the idea that, that he noticed was that uh, in all of these assays, right, you don't actually need the entire alignment. You don't need to know that there's some indel at like position 21 or something like that. All you care about is the, that, uh, that this read is compatible with this particular transcript. So at the end of the day, all you care about is just counting the number of compatible matches with a particular transcript. So um, we have an algorithm, and I'll show you that in a second. And basically, the way that uh, that it, it works, it, it, uh, it, it builds some, some uh, really clever data structures. And because of that, you can do uh, quantification quite fast. So um, you, we've, in our uh, benchmarks, we've been doing about 30 million reads in about two and a half, half minutes. Uh, this is including quantification times. Um, so it's anywhere from like 500 to 1,000 times faster than the existing approaches. Um, and you can actually do it on a laptop. So I gave a demo uh, doing uh, uh, Jasper Ryan's data set, uh, or someone from his group, uh, Aisha Alahi, uh, has this really interesting data set with uh, SIR2 knockdowns in yeast. Um, I gave a demo two or three weeks ago where I actually analyzed the entire data set, well, six of the samples on my laptop, and then did a shiny demo with it as well um, within like a 10 minute talk. So it's, it's quite fast. We did, basically did the whole analysis on my laptop in about four or five minutes. Um, so the, there's another really, really cool part uh, to this is that the speed allows you to do bootstrapping. So um, you can actually get uncertainty estimates on, uh, on that uh, transcript quantification. So I'll talk about why that's important in a few minutes when we get to the differential expression section. And so this is the Callisto uh, team. So Nick Bray had the sort of initial insights and he worked a lot with us uh, developing the algorithm. Uh, Paul Melstead uh, was uh, visiting Lior's group uh, last semester, and we uh, put together all the software for it uh, in about a semester. And uh, Lior is the PI, uh, also a professional blogger, if you've uh, visited his blog. <laughs> okay, so this is the data structure that sort of runs, uh, or that, that, that gives us quite a bit of an advantage in Callisto. Um, it's called, called the target to Brown graph. 
So here you have three different transcripts, and uh, they're all fairly similar from the same locus. And you basically build a kamer of every single, um, you, you take the kamer of every single transcript, every single kamer along the transcript, and you sort of walk along this path. And wherever they, uh, wherever they differ, you create a new uh, path. So there, there's like this junction in the, or, uh, or sorry, this uh, the split in the graph. Okay, so this green transcript differs by having a different uh, splice site in the center right there. So it it, uh, it splits off on this graph, and then at some point uh, they have the same sequence. So you know the red and, and blue transcript continue for some time, and then they uh, join back together. Okay, so this is the target the brown graph. Um, this is what we build given some annotation. So you give us some sort of FASTA file that has uh, a set of transcripts, and then we build this data structure from it. Um, with a human uh, transcriptome, I could build it on my Mac Pro, uh, like the little 13-inch one, in about five to seven minutes or so. And you do that once, OK? And then what we do when we get a read is uh, we match the kamers along this graph. And then if you notice, these, uh, all the paths are colored. So the colors basically tell us what uh, transcripts this match is compatible with. Um, so we, we end up getting what's uh, a pseudo alignment from this. And what, what we mean by that is basically the set of transcripts that, are, uh, that this read is compatible with. Um, so we also notice that once you have this sort of this data structure and you, you take a look at all the different kamers, if you take the intersection of all of the different uh, sets, the compatibility sets, it gives you an upper bound on the set of transcripts that it's, this particular read is compatible with. So you notice that uh, when the read starts on the left-hand side, um, it's compatible with red, green, and blue. Um, and then as you sort of walk along this graph, um, it's only compatible with red and blue. Um, and then we also do some other tricks to speed it up quite a bit. So um, you'll notice that uh, at the junction, I mean, is, the first three kamers have the same exact information, right? That, that, that it's compatible with red, green, and blue um, ac across those three. So any comparisons with those are basically wasted time. So what we can do, since we know what the sequence is, is we sort of jump ahead to the next junction, and then we jump ahead to the, to the very last uh, portion. And if they're the same, then there's basically no new information in the center of the read. So we can get away with very few um, comparisons. So in this case, we would only do two comparisons and we're done, whereas you can imagine doing an actual full-blown alignment at this locus is a, f a fair bit of work, right? So you would take, you would align to the, the blue transcript and compare every single sequence along uh, that uh, transcript, and then you would look at the red one and you'd have to do that again, and then you'd look at the green one and about halfway in, you would, you would stop. So this is basically where a lot of the speed comes up. Uh, okay. And uh, the speed is, is quite a big uh, performance. So this is, we have 20 samples with uh, 20 different cores. Um, and uh, so this is, on the left-hand side, you have the sort of canonical top hat and cufflinks um, algorithm. It takes about 2,000 minutes on this uh, server that we have. Then you have bow tie and RSIM. And then on the right-hand side, uh, to process all of these samples and with alignment and the quantification, we have Callisto that took about five minutes. Yeah. In what sense? So if you're comparing uh, related but not the same sequences and you are just in the variation, don't you miss on that? Yeah, so, so what you're saying is if I have like a SNP and I care about the SNP, like what, uh, am I missing that? Yeah. Uh, yes, so the, okay, so we have some ideas on actually how to identify SNPs. But I will say that like if, uh, like if you're doing, a, if you're interested in SNPs, like none of these pipelines will do that anyway. So like uh, your typical cufflinks algorithm, it, it, you could have SNPs all over the place, and it just won't uh, look at them. Right? So all it cares about, at the, all cufflinks cares about at the end of the day is that these reads are compatible with this particular transcript. And then it uses those counts to basically do this inference that we'll talk about in a minute. So it, yeah, you don't. So it's it's in the BAM file. I mean, the stuff is encoded in the BAM file. Um, but the thing is that you can't use cufflinks to identify SNPs. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. So and and you can't uh, like uh, if if you were to do this, you have to sort of 
you know, cook up your own sort of analysis. I'm sure there are like SNP pipelines that sort of do this type of thing, but it would it would sort of deviates entirely from uh, this type of thing, this type of analysis that we're talking about today. Does that answer your question? So this would be only targeted towards the expression. Yeah. So the, most of what I'm talking about today is from uh, the, you know doing quantification to differential expression analysis. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, in principle, you can you can actually find SNPs. So we've we've talked about this quite a bit on how with this algorithm, how do you actually find SNPs uh, using uh, using the target to Brown graph? Yeah, so it's 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 actually significantly much, uh, faster, and it's in some sense this this graph is a bit unfair to us because the disk can't keep up. Um, if you were to just process one of these samples, they take about two and a half minutes. Um, we become I/O bound, so the the you know the little rotational device on the magnetic disks can't uh, keep up. The CPU utilization goes to like 80% uh, when we run them all at the same time, um, and we don't really lose any accuracy. So we we did some simulations um, in the upcoming paper. We have a fair bit uh, more analysis, but in the preprint, you could see this. Uh, um, you can see this graph where basically uh, the, the simulations were generated using the RSIM model, and then we're, we don't assume the RSIM model, which is kind of uh, interesting in the sense that we're doing almost as good as the RSIM on a data set that was simulated using the RSIM model. Um, yeah, so I won't talk too much about that. But um, if you have questions about this, we can chat about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean you're stuck. Sure. My problem is even with good annotations, human advice, we have always those kind of novel isoforms, specific isoforms, kind of. And I think lumping all those features together will prevent the novel isoforms annotation step. Um. So okay, if you if you're interested in novel isoforms, I mean, the really the best way to to or the best approach to take is really doing an assembly. Um, you so I mean, an assembly is quite a bit of work. You need like really good data. You need long reads, or pre preferably you need longer reads, um, and you need a lot of them. Um, well. Okay, so we can argue about that. But the thing is that uh, I mean, pretty much like any method. Mo the, the, the method always assumes that you're starting with a good transcriptome. That's often a poor assumption, but there really isn't much you can do without doing the full assembly. So I understand that, what you're saying, and, and I totally agree with you, that if you have um, a missing annotation that, uh, and you're often interested in that missing transcript, then this will miss it. But uh, Callista will miss it, Arsim will miss it, Salmon will miss it, a Sailfish will miss it, and Cufflinks will miss it if you don't do an assembly. Um, and often, if you're not careful with the assembly, you can even get worse results if you if you ha end up with a lot of junk in the assembly, which is a possibility. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Kind of. So I mean, even if I'm not interested in the uh -huh. I, I don't want to predict them, but usually, mm -hmm. if, if you are trying to do the quantification, mm -hmm. I think some of the reads which are the reads that are mapping to the normalized forms are going to be mismapped. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. And again, this is like a, a systematic problem with, with any type of analysis like this. Um, we're not any more susceptible to it than pretty much anyone else. But um, so it, it, it also depends you know, on a number of different things, like, like how different is this isoform? How much longer is this isoform? How much is it compatible? Like if it just has a different uh, three prime UTR, then you might be okay. There's a number of different things that go into this analysis, and you know I can't give you like an, a blanket statement that says like you know all the time you're going to be okay, um, because it really depends on the locus, um, and it depends you know how similar and how dissimilar the the particular target is compared to everything else at that locus. Does that make sense? Yeah. 